Hi everyone, Charlie Girl here. Back to talk to you about how not to date a dickhead. <laughs> My first video was a little rough, and this one might be too. Just, it's, I'm not used to this YouTube thing, but today we're going to talk about the warning signs of a batterer. A dickhead, an asshole, an asswife, a butt hair, whatever you like to call them. A jerk. It all boils down to one thing. They're a batterer. But her, there's several warning signs. One of them is if they come and swoop in, they're just like there. They they're, they almost seem obsessed with you. It's and to you it might be like, oh my God, he's really like totally like into me. I my God. It, and oh goodness, they like just come in and, and uh, gifts and flowers and phone calls and the attention is just like overwhelming. You can either go two ways with this, you know, um, you can be a little freaked out by it, or you're kind of feeling, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Be freaked out. It's not so cool. Batters have um, the tendency to jump into relationships full force. They have nothing else going on in their little peon lives, and you become their obsession. Um, they want to make sure that you are all theirs. Um, my former batterer, um, Dr. Dickhead, he was the reason for this mini series. Um, we met online and uh, we were exchanging some emails back and forth. And then I gave him my phone number. And I, I wasn't able to, to take his phone call for the first couple of days. Um, and he called and called and called. I, I had two thoughts going on. Ah, oh, this is a little much. You know, I was like, oh, he's digging me. He's excited. How cool. Like a high school crush. Not cool. Within our first date, like a meeting with each other, he had he flew me from where I was at out to the East Coast. I lived on the West Coast. He flew me to the East Coast. Um, within that first meeting, that first date, he was already... Showing me different places for weddings, um, talking to me about engagement rings, and it, it was a lot. But I thought, wow, here's this brilliant neurosurgeon who is just captivated by me. You know, how cool is this? I mean, a 5.0 grade point average from MIT, you know, very, very well off. The head of surgery in the surgery department, I, I was really I was like, wow, this is, I'm flattered. You know, he bought me jewelry, he bought my kids jewelry, and he bought them presents. Um, it should have been, it should have been a real sign for the things to come that are fucking spooky. But, so if they come on really strong, uh, they're trying to kind of really make sure that they, they get you in. One of the other tendencies they have is to tell you about their poor, poor, poor life. I used to have to listen to him talk about all the things that had been done to him that were so bad. You know, his wife, um, she never really loved him. Um, the 28 women he had dated before me were all bitches or blankety blank blanks. I mean, you know, they, they, mean and grumpy and nasty and snappy and he didn't have anything good to say about them. But what he was trying to do was work on me as a woman, um, that nurturing side of a woman where we think, oh my god, that's so sad. He just needs some good love. He just needs somebody really with a good heart to love him. It doesn't work. What they're trying to do is get you to not only they're sweeping you off your feet so you feel like a princess. Um, they're also trying to get you to feel sorry for them. It's that back and forth type of thing, the black and white. You know, you feel like a princess and you also feel like you're the only one that can now save him. You feel sorry for him. So when you start to see a few of the bad signs, you continue to feel sorry for him. And you think, it'll be okay. You know, he, he's gone through some rough things. It's not that. They want you to feel sorry for them so that you do stick around. One of the other tendencies they have is to, as relationship progresses and grows, is to isolate you. Um, they're taking up all your time. They're trying to, to make sure that it's just 
you and them. You start to slowly let your relationships with other people die out. Not really die out, but you're not paying as much attention to them. Um, this is called isolation. Um, it, and it's brutal. And, and it's, it's very much planned. In my case, what he did was, I he really rude the hell out of me. Um, he bought me a Mercedes Benz for coats, um, everything. You know, I mean, he was spending the big bucks, and, and he knew that I was a single mom, so that I wasn't used to having these kind of things done for me, and he really came on strong. Um, the next step was he proposed to me. Everything he talked about was like the perfect life, exactly the things I wanted to be able to do with my life. Um, so once we got engaged, the next step was moving me across country. Well, moving me across country to a city I didn't know anyone at was his way of making sure I had nobody else to turn to. He would be my entire focus, um, which is what they try to do. Um, this way you're really under their control. When I first got here, he, um, he talked to me about He's like, you know what? You've had a past couple rough years. Why don't you take it easy for, you know, a month or two before you really start delving into, into your job. Um, enjoy your kids. Enjoy life. Well, this wasn't for that reason. This was so I became financially dependent on him. Um, the house that was rented. I would not have been able to afford on my own starting a new business. Um, everything. So, so, so far we've covered three of the different stages. You have the really fast, right now, right here relationship where it's just all consuming. You have the isolation. Um, and you have that aspect where you're feeling sorry for him. The very first night I got to my new home to be with him, I was exhausted. You know, totally, totally exhausted. My kids and I had just flown across country. It took us two days to get across country. Why did it take us two days? Because our plane almost went down. <laughs> we had to have an emergency landing. And, um, the first night we were here, we're exhausted, we're tired, and he wants to take us out to dinner. So we've got to dress up, you know, not even really take sleep or, or just get caught up. And we're out to dinner, and he tells me basically that... Um, you and your children don't behave the way I seem to deem appropriate. You'll be homeless. What? <laughs> so uh, that was really freaky. And now I no longer had a home to go back to. Um, no longer had my car because my car, I found out once I'm there too, was in his name. Um, even though it was supposed to be for me. Um, the utilities had not been put in my name. I had no, nothing that could be put in my name, um, which made it impossible for me to, to enroll my kids in school. Some of the other signs are an obsessive type of disorder um, where they continue to batter the hell out of you. If there's a disagreement, it's always your fault. It's if it's over the phone and you tell them you need a break from talking about it, they come back over and over and over and over. He called me 60, between 60 and 80 times in a four-hour time period. It was nuts. But I see I'm about ready to run out of time. So give me a few minutes and I'll be right back to you. Remember, don't date a dickhead. It's not worth it. There's good guys out there. Learn the warning signs. See you soon.